The following sermon by Henry Skugel is called Of the Importance and Difficulty of the Ministerial Function. Preached at the Senate of Aberdeen, 2 Corinthians 2.16 Who is sufficient for thee things? Reverend and dearly beloved men, brethren and fathers, it is one of the advantages of that place and tranquility in which Almighty God is pleased to bless this poor church that the officers of it have liberty of assembling together on these occasions for mutual assistance and counsel in the exercise of their holy function. And indeed, if there were no manner of public deliberation, yet ought we gladly to embrace the opportunity of seeing one another's faces, not only that we may maintain and express a brotherly correspondence and affection, but also that we may animate and excite one another to greater measure of diligence and zeal, as coals being gathered together, do mutually receive and propagate some new degrees of vigor and heat. This I have always looked upon as none of the meanest advantages of these synodical meetings, and shall think myself very happy if my poor endeavors in the performance of this present duty may by the divine blessing contribute anything towards this excellent and desirable purpose. To this end I have made choice of a text which I hope may afford us some useful meditations, for stirring up and awakening in our souls a deeper sense of those great engagements under which we lie. The blessed apostle in the former verse, and beginning of this verse, has been speaking of the different success the gospel met with among those to whom it was preached, that it was not like those weak and harmless medicines, which if they do no good are sure to do no hurt, but like some perfumes which are comfortable and strengthening to the wholesome, but troublesome and noxious to the weak. So does it prove a vital savor to those who receive and obey it, but a most deadly poison to all who reject and despise it. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, to them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death, and to the other a savor of life unto life. And then he takes occasion to consider what a great manner it is to be employed in those administrations in which the happiness and misery of mankind is so nearly concerned. And who is sufficient for these things? We will not detain you with an explanation of the words, but two things I conceive are implied in them. Number one, the importance. Number two, the difficulty of the ministerial function. For if a business be a small concern, it is little manner who has a management of it. There is no great harm done if it miscarries. Anybody is sufficient for that thing. On the other hand, let the manner be never so weighty. If there be no difficulty in it, there needs no extraordinary endowments in those to whom it is committed. Common prudence and little care will suffice. There is no likelihood that it can miscarry. But the work of the ministry is at once so important and so difficult, of so great consequence and so hard to be performed, that there is a great deal of reason for an emphatic interrogation. Who is sufficient for these things? First, let us fix our thoughts a while on the weight and importance of the ministry, and we shall find that it is a greater burden lying on our shoulders than if the greatest affairs of this world were devolved upon us, and we held up the pillars of the earth. This will appear whether we consider the relation we stand in to the Almighty God, or the charge of the flocks we have committed to us. To begin with the first, that infinite majesty which created and does continually uphold the earth and all things in it, as the just owner and lord of the whole creation, for all are his servants and must obey his will, is yet pleased to claim a special property in some things which he chooses for himself and employs for peculiar designs. Nevertheless, of old, he did choose a house for himself and a place to be called by his name. As Salem was his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion, the Lord loved the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob, and the church in all ages hath thought it fit to separate some places from vulgar and common use, and to appropriate them to the service of God. Again, though all times and seasons belong to God, 
yet has he set apart a day for his worship and sanctified a Sabbath for himself. All men were created for the honor of God and are infinitely obliged to serve him. Yet because the greatest part of mankind are too much engaged in worldly affairs and have their souls fettered in the distracting cares of this life and almost buried in their bodies, it has pleased the divine wisdom to call forth a select number of men who being delivered from those entanglements and having their minds more highly purified and more peculiarly fitted for the offices of religion may attend continually on that very thing. Religion is every man's general calling, but it is our particular calling too. And while the laborer is at his plow, the craftsman at his forge, and the merchant in his shop, the minister ought to be employed in the exercise of devotion for the interest of advancing piety and the honor of our Maker. My beloved, you are deputed, as it were, by the whole creation, at least by the inferior world, to present their homage and service to God and appraise Him for all His works. You ought to maintain a correspondence between heaven and earth, to deprecate the wrath of God and avert his vengeance and plague from mankind. Your business is the same with that of the holy angels. You dwell in the house of God and should be continually praising him. And this is an employment so holy that were our souls as pure as cherubs, as zealous and active as the blessed spirits that are above, we should yet have reason to cover our faces and to be swallowed up in a deep sense of our own insufficiency for these things. And what a sinful dust and ashes, that God should stand in so near a relation to us. What is man, O blessed God, that you should choose him and cause him to approach to you, that he should dwell in your courts, and be satisfied with the goodness of your house, even of your holy temple? The priesthood under the law was a very sacred and venerable thing, and no profane hand might intermeddle with the meanest offices that belonged to it. All the zeal and seemingly religious care that Uzzah had for the tottering ark didn't serve to excuse his presumption when he intruded upon the Levitical function. But certainly as the gospel ministry is so much more excellent and sublime, being entrusted with the administration of those holy mysteries which were but shadowed in the former, how pure and holy ought those lips to be, by which God speaks to his people, and by which they speak to him, which sometimes pronounce those powerful and effectual sentences of excommunication that are so surely ratified in heaven. The weight and importance of the ministerial function considered in relation to the people committed to our charge. We are not entrusted with their fortune or estate, nor with their bodily health and welfare nor with the affairs of state or the interest of kingdoms, though indeed religion has no small influence on these, and the labors of pastors, if successful, would contribute exceedingly to the public tranquility and the present happiness of men. But our main business lies another way. We have to do with rational and immortal souls, those most noble and divine substances which proceed from God and are capable of being united to Him eternally but with an hazard of being eternally separated from him. We may say, with the reason of our work, what the painter did vainly boast of, the impresses we make shall last forever. My beloved, the most serious of our thoughts come very far short of the inestimable worth of the depositum, that treasure which is committed to our care. He who created and redeemed the souls of men does best understand their value and we see what esteem he puts upon them by the pains he is pleased to take about them. Their salvation was contrived before the mountains were brought forth, before the foundation of the earth was laid. The design was formed from all eternity, and glorious are the methods by which it is accomplished. To this purpose did the deity empty itself, and was closed with the human nature. To this purpose was that strange and wonderful conjunction, God and man united together. Hitherto did all the actions and all the sufferings of our blessed Savior aim. For this he was born, and for this he did die. And shall we undervalue the price of his blood? Or think it a small manner to have the charge of those for whom it was shed? 
It is the church of God we must oversee and feed, that church for which the world is upheld, which is sanctified by the Holy Ghost on which the angels themselves attend. What a weighty charge is this we have undertaken, who is sufficient for these things. That these manners may yet take the deeper impression on our hearts, let us further consider the dreadful consequences of miscarriage and the discharge of the ministerial function, and we shall find that it reflects a great deal of dishonor on the Divine Majesty and on our Blessed Savior, that it does very much hazard the souls of our people and certainly ruins our own. I say it does reflect dishonor on Almighty God as the faults of servants do commonly prejudice the reputation of their masters and the failings of ambassadors are imputed to their princes. We stand in a nearer relation to God and are supposed to be best acquainted with His will and to carry the deepest impressions of His nature on our minds. And ignorant people will entertain the meaner thoughts of the holiness of God when they miss it in those who are called His servants. Certainly it is no small reproach which the faults or miscarriages of pastors bring upon the ways of godliness and holy religion we profess. It is no small affront that is by this put on the blessed author of it. Greater, without question, than all the malice and spite of his open enemies is able to practice. For by this he is crucified afresh and put unto an open shame. And oh, how great is the hazard our poor people run by our negligence or failings, even as much as the worth of their souls amount to. If the watchman be not faithful, and give not timely warning, the sword will readily come, and the people will be taken away in their sins. Like people, like priests, will still be a proverb of a general truth. But if the negligence and miscarriage of a pastor hazards the souls of others, it has certainly ruined his own. It may Chrysostom say, words so terrible that I tremble to put them into English, and yet, if a man should speak fire, blood, and smoke, if flames should come out of his mouth instead of words, if he had a voice like thunder and an eye like lightning, he could not sufficiently represent the dreadful account that an unfaithful pastor shall make. What horror and confusion shall it cast him into at the last day? to hear the blood of the Son of God plead against them, to hear our great Master say, It was the purchase of my blood which you neglected. God died for those souls of whom you took so little pains. Think not, therefore, to be saved by that blood which you have despised, or to escape the torments in which many others are plunged through your faults. By this time I hope it does appear that the work of the ministry is of great weight and importance, and much depends on the right discharging of it, and that miscarrying in it is the most dangerous thing in the world. Number two. The second thing we had to speak to is the difficulty of managing this charge aright, and this will appear if we consider the end and design of the ministerial function. Number two. The impediments we have to overcome in the prosecution of that end and Number three, the several sorts of duties and exercises incumbent upon us. As for the first, the great business of our calling is to advance the divine life in the world, to make religion sway and prevail, frame and mold the souls of men into a conformity to God, and superinduce the beautiful lineaments of his blessed image upon them, to enlighten their understandings and inform their judgments, rectify their wills and order their passions and sanctify all their affections. The world lies in sin and it is our work to awaken men out of their deadly sleep, to rescue them out of their dismal condition. We are the instruments of God for effecting these great designs. And though we be not accountable for the success when we have done what lies in our power, yet nothing below this should be our aim and we should never cease our endeavors until that gracious change be worked in every person committed to our charge. If any think this is an easy work, let them pitch on some person of their acquaintance whom they know to be addicted to some one particular vice, and try whether it be easy to reclaim him. Persuade the drunkard, if you can, to forsake his cups, the covetous wretch, to part with his money, reason but the wild gallant into serious thoughts and a grave and sober deportment, 
try to purge your neighborhood of gross crimes and scandalous vices, and persuade those that live about you to live at least as becomes men. In this you have the advantage of dealing with that self-love which does prevail in them. You may easily convince them that the practice of these virtues you recommend would contribute much to their temporal happiness, to those interests of pleasure, advantage, and honor, to which they have the greatest regard, and yet you shall find even this task not easy to be performed. But to raise men to the greatest heights of mortification and self-denial, to make them truly humble, meek, and resigned to the will of God, to overpower that selfish principle which is so deeply rooted in the constitution of our souls, and does so readily insinuate itself into all our affections and designs, to set divine love and universal charity upon the throne, that the honor of God and the welfare of others may be as dear to men as their own concerns, to have religion become another nature to them, and they, as it were, a living law to themselves. This... This is so great and wonderful a change that only omnipotence is able to produce it. So certainly they have a mighty task who are employed as instruments in it. Again, let me appeal to the conscience and experience of everyone what difficulty they find in dealing with their own souls, in regulating their own passions, and in mortifying their own corrupt affections. Yet here we have the advantage of a nearer application we can carry home our reasons with more force upon ourselves and others. Our thoughts and meditations must be more clear and lively than our words and expressions are. If it be hard then to persuade ourselves to be good, it is sure much harder to persuade others to be so. Consider in the next place the enemies we have to encounter with, which oppose the design of our employments. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. All the forces of hell are up in arms against us. All the powers of darkness continually oppose us. And little do we know those hidden arts in which these accursed spirits do apply themselves to the souls of men, to suggest and insinuate their temptations. The world also, with all its cares and pleasures, is daily fighting against us and there is no estate or condition in it but what is surrounded with a thousand temptations. The poor are so much taken up in providing for the necessities of this life that they can hardly be persuaded to think upon another. The rich are commonly drowned in sensual pleasures, and our Savior tells us it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The influence of sensual objects is very strong. And though the possessions of the other world be as far beyond our enjoyments here, as this world is above nothing, yet because the things of this world are present, and are ever and anon offering themselves to us, and bearing upon our senses, therefore they frequently prevail against all the persuasions of reason and religion also. And what shall we say of the evil company and bad example that inveigles the souls of men? We perhaps see them once a week and bring them to some degree of sobriety and a sound mind. But then their wicked neighbors and the companions of their sin meet them every day and by their counsel and example obliterate any good impression that has been made upon them. And by this we lose more in a week than we are able to recover in a whole year. But the greatest enemies we have are those within the souls of men. Their depraved affections their lusts and corrupt inclinations. When doctors undertake to cure a bodily distempers, they have the consent of the party. He is ready to comply with their prescriptions. But our greatest difficulty is in dealing with the wills of men and making them consent to be cured. They hug the disease and shun the medicine as poison and have no desire to be well. So it is they do all they can to keep us strangers to their souls and take as much pains to conceal their inward distempers as they ought to do in revealing them. We have justly shaken off the tyranny of the Romish confession, but alas, our people go too far in the other extreme, and because they are not obliged to tell everything to their pastors, in effect they acquaint them with nothing at all. 
perhaps some persons lying under some terrors and troubles of mind may apply themselves to us to give vent to the fire that burns within them, but otherwise they content themselves to see us in the pulpit and care not how little we be acquainted with their temper and way. It will be long ere any come to tell us that they find themselves proud or passionate or revengeful and inquire how they shall get these vices subdued, that they are covetous and uncharitable, and beseech us to tell them how they shall amend, to acquaint us with their temptations, and to learn the fittest methods to oppose them. We are seldom troubled with addresses of this nature, and it is hard to do anything towards a cure, when they will not let us know the disease. The difficulty of the ministerial function will further appear, if we will consider the several duties and exercises of it, we shall but touch at some of them at present, and may perhaps have occasion to speak more in the application. Catechizing is a necessary but painful one. It is no small toil to tell the same things a thousand times to some dull and ignorant people, who perhaps shall know but little when we have done. It is this laborious exercise that sometimes tempts a pastor to envy the condition of those who gain their living by the sweat of their brows without the toil and distraction of their spirits. Preaching is an exercise that many are ambitious of, and none more than those that are least qualified for it. And it is probable the desire of this liberty is no small temptation to some of our giddy people to go over to the sect and party, where all ranks and both sexes are allowed the satisfaction to hear themselves talk in public. But it is not so easy a manner to perform this task aright, to stand in the presence of God, and to speak to his people in his name, with that plainness and simplicity, that seriousness and gravity, that zeal and concern which the business requires, to accommodate ourselves to the capacity of the common people, without disgusting our more knowing hearers by the insipid flatness of our discourse, to excite and awaken drowsy souls without terrifying and disturbing more tender consciences, to bear home the convictions of sin, without the appearance of some personal reflection, and a word to approve ourselves to God as workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Discipline is an edged tool, and they had need be no fools that meddle with it. It is a hard thing to manage the processes of the censors of the church with such care and prudence, that may neither encourage flagitious persons by our remissness, nor tempt to irritate others by needless severity, nor give advantage to captious and troublesome men for lack of some legal formality. But certainly the greatest and most difficult work of a pastor is in applying himself particularly to the several persons under his charge, to acquaint himself with their behavior and the temper of their souls, to redress what is amiss, and prevent their future miscarriages. Without this private work, his other endeavors will do little good. And considering the great variety that is among the humors and dispositions of men, equal almost to that of their faces, this must needs be an infinite labor. It is the art of art, says Gregory Nazinzian in his apologetic oration, and the most difficult of all sciences, to govern such a manifold and various creature as man. And another Gregory has written a whole tractate of the diversity there is amongst men's tempers, and the several ways of dealing with them. What a martyrdom is it for some modest and bashful tempers, when they find themselves obliged to use freedom and severity in reproving the faults of those who, in quality or age, are above themselves. And oh, what a hard manner it is to deal with people that are ready to leave the world and step in upon eternity 
when their souls do, as it were, hang on their lips, and they have one foot, as we used to say, already in the grave. The pastor is seldom sent for until the physician has given the patient over, and then they beg him to dress their souls for heaven when their winding sheet is preparing, and their friends are almost ready to dress the body for the funeral. Now, though some of these have lived well, and like the wise virgins, have oil in their lamps, yet it is a great manner to calm them and to dispose their souls for that great change they are presently to undergo. But alas, it fares otherwise with the greatest part. They are yet strangers to the ways of religion. The work of their salvation is yet to begin, and their lusts to be mortified, their corruptions subdued, the whole frame of their souls to be changed. And though they have scarce so much strength as to turn them on their beds, yet their warfare against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness is but newly commenced. Their work is great, their disadvantages many, and a time very short that is before them. Perhaps they are dull and insensible, and we shall hardly persuade them of their danger. They will acknowledge they are sinners, and so are all others as well as they. They trust to the mercies of Christ, and have confidence enough of their salvation, and cannot be persuaded they lack anything that is necessary for it. Others of these, again, are seized with fear, and call for the pastor to comfort them. What shall he do? Shall he tell them that all their terrors are just, and it is now too late to repent? I know some divines are peremptory in this case, and think they should be left in despair. But sure it were a sad employment for a pastor to go to visit a dying man, only to tell him he is damned, and withal it is too great boldness in us to limit the grace and mercy of God. True and sincere repentance will never come too late, but certainly a deathbed repentance is seldom sincere, and it is hard either for the pastor or the man himself to tell whether it will be only the fear of hell or a true and godly sorrow that he feels in his soul. All that a pastor can do is to press him to all possible seriousness and to resign himself to God for the event or to lay before him in general the terms and conditions of the gospel covenant. The application will be hard and uncertain. These, and many more, are the difficulties of the pastoral function. It was not without a great deal of reason that one of the fathers called it a weight under which angels' shoulders might shrink. So it was that holy men of old had been so mightily afraid to undertake it. Jeremiah, who was sanctified from the womb, and ordained a prophet to the nations, when he received his communion, cried out, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And Ezekiel, though strengthened and confirmed by God, yet went unwillingly, yea, in the bitterness and indignation of his spirit. And in the ancient church, the more eminent and great persons were in piety and worth, the more sensible they were of the greatness of this charge, and the more loath to engage in it. Some of them have fled into the mountains and deserts, or hid themselves in the dens and caverns of the earth, and were more afraid to be laid hands on by the bishop than by the most bloody persecutors. Three times did Ambrose flee from Milan, and it is reported that after he traveled hard all night he found himself next morning at the outer gate of the city he endeavored to avoid. Gregory Nezanzin, being taken in his flight and ordained by force, did compose that excellent oration which is at the beginning of his works, and which he does so well express the greatness and the danger of the ministry, that the reading of it, and I wish it were frequently and attentively read, might, I think, do much to quell the confidence of the most confident intruders. Augustine entered, by chance, in the church of Hippo, just as the bishop Valerius was speaking to the people concerning the choice of a pastor, of whom they stood in great need. He was presently pitched upon and almost ordained by force, after he had with tears deprecated the charge, and in these strange terms, quid voltus ut parem, intimating the hazard he should thereby run. In Chrysostom, 
professes of himself that when he was chosen to a bishopric, his soul and body were almost parted asunder. So great was the grief and fear that seized upon his spirits, and that he did many times wonder how it had ever entered into the minds of those that chose him, or what great offense that church had been guilty of, which had provoked God to suffer it to be committed to such an unworthy person. So sensible were these excellent men of the difficulties of this holy function, even in those first and golden ages of the church, and certainly they are much augmented to us who live in these dregs of time in which religion is almost banished out of the world. The principles of it called in question by many pretenders to judgment and wit, and the practice not only neglected, but derided, insomuch that men are frighted from godliness by the contempt that lies upon it. We have a world of wickedness to fight against, and who is sufficient for these things? Thus, having prosecuted the importance of the text, it is time to make some application of it. First, I shall address myself to those of the laity who vouchsafe us their presence, that they may not think their time is spent in some hours of attendance. You see, dear people, what a weighty and difficult charge they have to whom your souls are committed. Whence is it, then, that some of you account the pastoral function the most useless employment in the commonwealth, and that which might be most easily spared, and that pastors have easy lives gaining their living by the breath of their mouths, as some of you are pleased to word it. So is it that this holy calling comes to be so much despised, and that the names of pastor, parson, or priest are become words of ignominy and contempt, and whatever advantages of birth and education a pastor may have, yet his employment is thought enough to degrade him and put him below every man that can pretend to the name of a gentleman. Again, how comes it that those small gleanings of the church's patrimony, which sacrilege and oppression have left us, should yet be envied and looked upon with an evil eye, and that a clergyman, who has spent his time and much of his fortune in the schools of the prophets, to fit himself for that employment in which he may be most beneficial to mankind, should yet be maligned for a small annuity during life, which perhaps amounts not to the gains of the meanest tradesman. And yet if those persons had chosen another employment, perhaps they would have had parts and abilities sufficient to have advanced themselves to wealth and honors, as well as others, and would not have been envied for it. My beloved, I account him not worthy of the name of a pastor of Christ, who cannot patiently suffer injury, contempt, and envy. But certainly it is no good part in the people to put these upon them. It is a shrewd token that they have a small regard of piety and religion, and that their own souls are the things about them for which they have the least concern. Learn, I beseech you, dear Christians, learn to take more rational measures of things. Think how much you are indebted to the divine goodness which has taken so great care of your everlasting happiness as to set apart an order of men whose business it shall be to promote and advance it. Do all that you can to encourage and assist them in their work. Give them the encouragement of your constant attendance and assist them by helping to instruct those children and servants who are under your several charges. Apply yourselves frequently to them for advice and direction, and be often putting up that important question, What shall we do to be saved? Yield them that submission and obedience which is due them in the Lord. Don't go to church to sit as judges and censor the sermon when you return. If you be not pleased with it, your ignorance or indisposition may be the cause, and modesty should oblige you to silence. If you are taken with what you have heard, don't spend your time and talk about it. Practice is the best way to commend it. Beware of that spiritual pride and conceitedness which makes the people to strive with their pastors, which the prophet Hosea notes as an heinous sin. Finally, to sum up your duty in the apostles' words, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you.
I might in the next place take an occasion from what has been said to press the great obligation that lies on patrons of churches to seek out and to make choice of those whom they judge to be best qualified for so high and weighty a charge, and might show that it is no small guilt that he draws upon himself, who presents a person to the care of souls, of whose prudence and fidelity it may be he has so little confidence that he dares not entrust him with the management of his fortune or the tutory of his child, while perhaps others are overlooked that might be capable to do much more service in the church merely because they have not the good luck to be related or recommended to the patron, or because they have less money or more conscience than the bargain for the living. But I forbear this, and shall crave liberty of this venerable auditory to take this occasion of doing something that relates to my peculiar function, and speaking a little to those sons of the prophets, those candidates of holy orders whose diligence and study are for the ministry, and who are to be employed in the vineyard of God when the present laborers shall be called off to receive their reward. You see, sirs, what a dreadful and important charge it is to which you aspire. Consider, I beseech you, what great pains are necessary to fit and qualify you for it. Ordinary callings are not learned without a long apprenticeship. And will the art of governing souls be learned on a sudden? It is not knowledge of controversy, or the gift of eloquence, much less a strong voice and bold confidence that will qualify you for it. The errors that should abound among us make it necessary indeed that you should know how to deal with the adversaries. For the clergy are many times put to the pass, the Jews were, at the building of the second temple. With one hand they must build the house of God, and with the other they must hold a weapon. Yet certainly your greatest work lies within in purifying your minds and learning that wisdom which is necessary for souls. Begin then, I pray you, and preach to your passions, and try what good you can do to your friends and neighbors. Study that gravity and seriousness, that humility and self-denial, that purity and mortification that becomes those who may one day stand in so near a relation to God, and bear so imminent a charge in his church. Don't be hasty and forward in rushing into public. It is better you be drawn than run. Nisanzian complains of some in his time who with profane hearts and unwashed hands did rush into the holy function, and before they were fit to receive the sacrament, would take upon them to celebrate it. And though they be not come unto the age of men, if they have learned some pious words, think themselves fit to be overseers of others. This, I say, was the humor of some in his days, and I am afraid the case is not much better in ours. But if you be truly sensible of what you are to undertake, you should thank no time too much to be spent in preparation for it. It remains yet that I address myself briefly to you, my reverend brethren and right reverend fathers. We have been endeavoring to lay before you the importance and difficulty of your employment, and you know them much better than we can tell you. But these things ought not to discourage you or make you faint under the weight, but rather to animate and excite your care. As Alexander said once of an imminent hazard he had encountered, that now he had met with a danger worthy his courage, so may I say of your work, it is a business worthy your zeal and the love and affection which you owe to your blessed master. And indeed you can give no greater testimony of it than by a faithful and conscientious discharge of the duties of your calling. If your work is great, your reward is infinitely greater, and you have omnipotence engaged in your assistance. Up and be doing, and the Lord shall be with you. Only let us be careful to maintain such a deep and constant sense of the engagements we lie under, as may awaken us to the great diligence and watchfulness, both over ourselves and others. As for the particulars of your duty, I dare not take upon me to be an instructor, who have much more need to learn my own. Yet since I am not placed here to be altogether silent, I shall offer to you the Apostle's exhortation at Titus, in chapter 2, verse 15 and take the liberty to insist a little upon the particulars of it. These things speak and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. 
these things speak. Here he points at that which ought to be the matter of our doctrine and instruction. We are not to entertain our people with subtle speculations, metaphysical niceties, perplexed notions and foolish questions which engender strife. But let us speak to things which become sound doctrine. Let us frequently inculcate the great and uncontroverted truths of our religion and trouble our people no further with controversy than necessity requires. Let us study to acquaint them with the tenor of the gospel covenant and what they must do to be saved, to inform them of the particular duties they owe both to God and man. For the apostle had before been speaking of the duties to be recommended to everyone according to their several capacities and relations. And indeed it were not amiss that in catechizing, pastors would bring home the articles of faith by practical improvements, both teaching men their particular duties and pressing them to the performance. But it is not enough to speak these things, to tell men what is incumbent upon them, we must besides endeavor to excite and stir them up by the most powerful and effectual persuasions, the judgment being informed. We must do all to influence the affections, and this is a proper use of our preaching, which, though it be overvalued by those who place all religion in hearing, yet certainly it is of excellent use and ought to be managed with a great deal of care. Let the manner be weighty and grave, the method plain and clear, the expression neither soaring on the one hand, nor too familiar on the other. Some good men are not aware what contempt they draw on religion by their coarse and homely allusions, and the silly and trivial proverbs they make use of. Nor should our expression be too soft or effeminate, nor our pronunciation affected or childish. Religion is a rational and manly thing, and we should strive to recommend it with the greatest advantage. But above all, let us study such a zeal and fervor as flowing from the deep sense of the things we speak, and being regulated with prudence and decency, may be fitted to reach the hearts of the hearers. The vulgar that commonly sit under the pulpit, as the excellent Herbert speaks, are commonly as hard and dead as the seats they sit on, and need a mountain of fire to kindle them. The best way is to preach the things first to ourselves and then frequently to recollect in whose presence we are and whose business we are doing. And I think it no small advantage that some of a neighboring nation have, who make some considerable pause when they have done with a point, that they may raise their souls towards God and that the people may renew their attention. But when we have done all that we can by public and general exhortation, we shall effectuate very little without a more particular application to the persons under our charge. Interest and self-love will blind the eyes and stop the ears of men, and make them shift off from themselves those admonitions from the pulpit that are displeasing. And therefore we are commanded not only to teach and exhort, but also to rebuke with all authority. Now those whom we are to rebuke are either persons of a different persuasion, who dissent from our religion, or withdraw from our ordinances. And these must be dealt with very patiently and with much long-suffering. It is not to be expected that in hasty conference or an abrupt disputation should prevail with those who have been long habituated to false persuasions, and perhaps have drunk them in with the first of their serious thoughts and religious inclinations, we must first study to combat the perverseness of their will, the prejudices of the world, the desire of victory and applause, their pre-engagement in a party and their shame and unwillingness to yield and strive to render them meek and pliable, and sincerely desirous to know the truth. When we have obtained this, they will be both more easily convinced and more inexcusable if through weakness they still continue in their errors. But let us never rest, and having drawn over a person to our party, till we have engaged him to seriousness in the practice of religion. For if he continue a stranger to that, it is little matter whether he be a Protestant or a Papist, Pagan, or Mohammedan, or anything else in the world, nay, the better his religion is, the more dreadful will his condemnation be. It was an excellent saying of an eminent and holy person yet alive in our church, that he would rather be instrumental in persuading one man to be serious in religion than the whole nation to be conformists. 
The other sort of persons we have to rebuke are those of our own religion, for the vices and failings of their lives, and this must be done with a great deal of courage and zeal, of prudence and discretion, of meekness and love. More knowing and ingenious persons may be dealt with sometimes by secret insinuations and oblique reflections on the vices they are guilty of. And we may sometimes seek a way to reprove their failings by regretting and condemning our own. But that artifice is not necessary with the vulgar. Having professed our love and good intentions, it will be best to fall roundly to the matter. Now this does suppose a great deal of care to acquaint ourselves with the humors and conversations of our people, and the name of watchmen that is given us implies no less. And though the lamentable vastness of some of our charges make it impossible to do all that we could wish, yet must we not fail to do all that we can. It is an excellent practice of some I have the happiness to be acquainted with, who seldom miss any day in which they do not apply themselves to some or other of their people and treat about the affairs of their souls. Another thing which may be implied in rebuking with all authority is a conscientious exercise of that authority which Christ has given us in the public censors and rebukes of the church. But of this I shall say no more, save only that it were an intolerable presumption and horrid sacrilege to make use of these to serve the ends of our passion and private revenge. The last clause of the passage we cited sounds somewhat strange. Let no man despise you. Of course, nobody desires to be despised and it is not always in the power of man to hinder it. But the meaning of the word is that there should be nothing in our carriage and deportment which may deserve contempt. There is nothing that exposes a minister to so much contempt as a vicious and irreligious deportment. Even those who are profane themselves and love vice and their other companions do yet abhor it in a clergyman, as thinking it too gross and disingenuous to practice all the week what he has been condemning on Sunday. I shall not insist upon the grosser sort of vices. I would not bode so much evil to the church as to imagine the clergy capable of them. I shall point but to a few things which, though less heinous in their nature, tend to the contempt and disrespect of the clergy. First, the least imputation of covetousness does a great deal of mischief this way. And you know it will be reckoned covetousness in you, which is not so in others. You will be more blamed for taking your own than they for encroaching on their neighbors. And therefore, to prevent this imputation, so far as the meanness of a pastor's provision and necessity of his family will permit, he should show himself frank and liberal in his dealings, especially with the poorer sort. Another occasion of contempt is the too much frequenting the company of the laity and a vain and trifling conversation among them. It was a wise saying, whoever he was that spoke it. A pastor in his conversation ought carefully to avoid all foolish and excessive jesting and immoderate mirth. I can never think it a good character of a clergyman to call him a merry fellow or a notable droll. And yet I do not condemn all cheerfulness and freedom, nor the innocent exercise of wit. But it is one thing to make use of these now and then, when they come in our way, and another to search and hunt after them, and those who have the knack of it are ready enough to fall into excess. A third thing which will bring a clergyman into contempt is an unallowable patience in hearing his master dishonored by the oaths and profane talk of those of whom he stands in awe. My brethren, if we had no more but the common principles of ingenuity and honor, they might make us resent these as greater affronts than if men should spit in our faces. And yet this is but one of the meanest engagements that lie upon us to check these exorbitances with the greatest severity. I shall name but another, and it is this. When men on design to avoid this contempt would seem to disclaim their employment by imitating the habit and deportment of secular persons, when they study the gentleman so much that they forget the clergyman. If we are ashamed of our own employment, no wonder if others despise it. Far different were the thoughts of that worthy gentleman and excellent pastor whom I named before, that sweet singer of Israel, Mr. Herbert, 
who the same night that he was admitted into the office of the ministry said to his friend, I now look back on my aspiring thoughts and I think myself more happy than if I had obtained what I so ambitiously thirsted for. And I can now behold the court with an impartial eye and see plainly that it is made up of fraud and titles and flattery and many such other imaginary painted pleasures. My greatest ambition from henceforth shall be that I bring glory to my Jesus, whom I have this day taken to be my master and governor, and am so proud of his service that I will always observe and obey and do his will and always call him Jesus my master. I will always contemn my birth and any title or dignity that can be conferred upon me when I shall compare them with the title of being a pastor and serving at the altar of Jesus my master. I am afraid I have encroached too far on your patience. I shall close all with the serious obstetation of our great apostle to Timothy, which you may believe I dare not utter in my own name, but in the name of the great master of us all. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And the Lord of his mercy, so assist and prosper us all in his work, that we may be the happy instruments of advance in his kingdom and the welfare of souls. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so on. The Ministerial Function. Henry Scougal.